Hello, Max Ruska of the Aviation News Talk Network here. I want to talk about the crash of November 257 Bravo Whiskey, a Citation 550 that killed NASCAR driver Greg Biffle and his family last month, and show you what the data tell us, which is that the aircraft was experiencing errors in the altitude data being fed to its ADSB out. And it's entirely possible that the crew saw those altitude errors in one of the altimeters in the cockpit. Now, there's been all kinds of speculation about why the aircraft turned back to the airport shortly after takeoff. But the answer has been hiding in plain sight in the ADSB data. And I say it's been hiding because I didn't see it when I first looked at it. And I've only seen one other person mention these altitude errors on social media. And we can confirm this because ADSB out transmits two sets of data, one of which is barometric altitude and the other of which is geometric altitude, which is based on a GPS signal. And when you compare these two sets of data, you can see where they diverge. Now, I don't believe that these altitude errors were responsible for the crash itself, since pilots don't spend much time looking at the altimeter when they're on final flying a visual approach to land. But I think it's very likely that these altitude errors were the reason the crew decided to return to the airport. And we'll probably know for sure when the NTSB reveals what was on the cockpit voice recorder, possibly in the preliminary report expected later this month, or in the final report, which should be out in 12 to 18 months. Now, listeners to two of my audio podcasts, NTSB News Talk and Aviation News Talk, have already heard about this in detail. So if you really want to go into depth about the aircraft systems and what likely caused the altitude errors, Listen to episode 409 of Aviation News Talk, which you can find at aviationnewstalk.com slash 409. Now, we first talked about this crash in episode 19 of NTSB News Talk, which I recorded with my co-host Rob Mark on the day of the crash. And here's what I said then. Well, you mentioned accidents, and we had one happen this morning. Yeah, it was uh, pretty significant. This was a citation 550 that crashed in Statesville, North Carolina, November 257. Bravo Whiskey. Uh, unfortunately, there were six people on board, two pilots and four passengers. According to one article, I've read that the owner, who was a well-known person associated with NASCAR, was on board and he and his family passed away. Here's what we know about it. Preliminary information indicates the jet had just taken off from runway 10. At some point, reported engine problems and they were trying to return and land on runway 28. Now, I saw a video that showed the trees that they went through just before they crossed a road and then went through the airport perimeter fence before finally coming rest close to the runway. So they got back incredibly close and somehow lost things just at the very end. And of course, there was a post-crash fire and everyone was killed. The ADSB track shows us that they were in the air for about seven minutes. The field elevation is 967 feet. And they took off from runway 10, made a climbing left turn, leveled out somewhere around 2,000 feet, continued to the uh, southwest. And then after being level for a period of time, at one point in a 20-second period, they jumped up about 2,000 feet, which would be a 6,000-foot-per-minute climb rate. So that's rather unusual. They then leveled off around 4,700 feet, made a 180-degree turn back toward the airport on what was essentially a 45 for a left to traffic to runway 28. On downwind, they were just 1,500 feet, which is about 500 feet above field elevation. So extremely low to be flying that downwind. They succeeded in making the turn to uh, base and then to final. They were reasonably well lined up with the final, but unfortunately crashed at the very, very end. The accident occurred about 10:15 local time, about 17 minutes before the accident. The automated surface observation system reported calm winds, visibility of five miles, heavy drizzle, broken ceiling at 1,200 feet and 2,200 feet. And then about 20 minutes later or three minutes after the accident, the automated system reported calm winds, visibility of one and three quarter miles, heavy rain, and a scattered layer at 400 feet and a ceiling at 1,000 feet above the ground. So the weather was poor but it does appear that they must have had some type of mechanical difficulty when they came back to the uh, runway. And I would guess the reason they were so low on downwind was just to stay below the clouds. Again, they did a remarkable job of making the turn to final. My guess is they probably brought up the ILS for uh, runway uh, 28 and used that to guide them for their turn to final. 
but unfortunately, uh, this was a fatal accident. So it'll, it's going to be interesting to find out exactly what happened because generally with a twin engine aircraft, if you have problems with one engine, you should still be able to fly back, but something happened and prevented them from completing that return to the airport. Notice I said they jumped up about 2,000 feet, which would be a 6,000 foot per minute climb rate. And that's because at that point, I had only looked briefly at the altitude jump, and I looked at it over a longer period of time, which made the climb rate seem lower. Later, I was contacted by Scott Hamilton of WBTAM News Talk Radio in Charleston, South Carolina, to come on their show and talk about the accident. So I spent some more time researching the data. And that's when I discovered the altitude jump was much more dramatic if you looked at it over a shorter period of time, and that the jump was closer to 50,000 feet per minute, which could only be achieved by some military fighters. Then I noticed something even more telling. The ADSB out pressure altitude stayed frozen, identical down to the foot for 34 seconds, and then suddenly jumped up more than 1,300 feet in under two seconds. Now that's the signature of a data feed that briefly got stuck and then caught up all at once, creating the illusion of a rapid climb when the aircraft was almost certainly climbing at a normal rate. Here's what I said on WBT. We've got some, some important clues, but first let me just extend my condolences to the family and the, the loved ones who you know, lost uh, you know, friends and family in this terrible tragedy. Uh, I, I've lost you know, friends in plane crashes, and I, I know how terrible that is, and I just wanted to say that uh, you know, the reason we talk about crashes is really to help prevent future crashes. You know, pilots are, they learn a lot from what happens in other accidents, and so that's why we talk about these things. But the, uh, I think the big question initially was, why did this aircraft turn back to the, uh, the runway? In my Aviation News Talk podcast uh, a week or so ago, I mentioned that there was a, a jump in the altitude at one point. And I went back and looked at that after you contacted me. And what I discovered is that that jump that we see in the data was about uh, 1,300 feet in about two seconds, which is just physically impossible. And that would imply a climb rate of about 50,000 feet per minute, which is not possible. And so what I discovered is that the reported pressure altitude was stuck for about 34 seconds. Uh, and so that indicates some type of malfunction in the way the altitude data was being collected. And then apparently the altimeter uh, reporting system caught up you know, and jumped back to where it should be. And I think the aircraft then turned back toward the runway about 20 seconds later. So either air traffic control noted this discrepancy and advised the pilots. In some cases, the pilots can note this kind of discrepancy in the cockpit. In some cases, they can't. But I think that's the reason that they ended up turning back toward the runway. Now, that was just a part of the interview. And you'll notice I didn't say ADSB out because I knew most of the listeners wouldn't be pilots and wouldn't understand that. So I referred to it as the altimeter reporting system. Let's look at raw ADSB barometric data. You can see here where the altitude suddenly jumps over 1,300 feet in under two seconds. And you can see that for 34 seconds prior, the altitude was the same. Now let's look in Google Earth at two plots. The one in blue is that same barometric altitude that we were just looking at. And the track in red is the geometric altitude, which is derived from GPS readings. First, you can see how the blue plot remains at a constant altitude before suddenly jumping up. And now if we look at the red track, the geometric altitude, we can see that the aircraft was in a steady climb of about 2,200 feet per minute, which would be typical for a citation climbing out. Why did the barometric altitude get stuck for 34 seconds? Well, there are a couple ways that could have happened, and I talk about it in detail in episode 409 of Aviation News Talk. One is that since this was an older aircraft, it may have had an altitude encoding altimeter in the cockpit, and it's possible that the mechanical mechanism in that altimeter became hung up for a time and later became unstuck. This kind of sticking your lag can occur because the forces moving the gears are tiny and friction or contamination can make the needles hang and then release. But a more common source of altimeter errors is issues with a pitot-static system, specifically with a static port and the tube connecting it to the air instruments, the altimeter, airspeed indicator, and vertical speed indicator. Water sometimes gets in the static port when an aircraft is washed improperly. Industry and FAA guidance says to cover pitot tubes and static port openings before washing to prevent water intrusion. 
Of course, it was running at the airport after the accident, and conceivably the aircraft could have picked up a temporary water blockage in flight. So I think some type of faulty altitude readout triggered the return to the airport. However, I don't think that's the reason the aircraft crashed, and I'm far less certain about what caused the actual crash. But one possibility is that there is a visual illusion called water refraction, in which water droplets on a windshield act like tiny lenses and refract or bend light, altering the apparent position of the horizon so the horizon looks lower. And if the horizon looks lower, your brain interprets that as more nose-up, higher attitude. And sometimes pilots will react by lowering the nose, and that can result in a lower approach and a crash short of the runway. I talk about all of this in more detail in episode 409 of Aviation News Talk. And if you would, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. And if you like audio podcasts, search for and follow both Aviation News Talk and NTSB News Talk in your favorite podcast app.